This past year, I've been sort of blessed in a strange way. I've gotten to travel all around Russia, and even better, I was able to film it all and share it all with you. I've gotten to film the cathedrals and palaces in St. Petersburg and Moscow, the stunning nature of distant republics like Karelia, and I've even gotten to check out some smaller towns along the way like Razan and Tula and Kolomna. But this week, I'm back on my way to Moscow, and I'm not just here to visit the landmarks like I was doing in the past. I'm trying to travel deeper into the Russian psyche. Russia has many of these things called home museums, which is turning the apartments or houses of famous people into living museums with their stuff. And this week, I am going to visit two of Russia's most famous playwrights, novelists, literary experts who influenced me tremendously long before I came here. Let's learn a little something about some guys named Gogol and Bulgakov. If you're the type of person who's taken to any Russian literature over the years, I'm sure you've heard of at least one of these guys. They are intensely integral, not only to the Russian thought of their day, but still continue to influence Russia to the present. From the simplicity of childhood stories all the way to the rebellious teen years, Russians are inundated with their works. So, for the sake of organization of this video, I'm going to start in sequence and take you all with me through the life and personal home of the Russian Empire's very own Edgar Allan Poe, Nikolai Vasilievich Gogol. Nikolai was born in the Ukrainian Cossack town of, and I apologize for my pronunciation, Sorochunsi, man that's a mouthful, which was a part of the Russian Empire at the time in 1809. His upbringing was in the villages of Cossack Ukraine, which Cossacks are sort of like cool Slavic cowboys. And this would later play a massive influence on some of his most notable works, including the likes of one of my favorites, The Night Before Christmas. This tale is told every single winter on stage, in novels, and even in classic Soviet-era cartoons and movies. Every Russian grew up watching these videos, and it became a major shaping of their cultural upbringing, much like those cool animated Christmas cartoons like Charlie Brown and the Grinch are to us Americans. But this picturesque influence wasn't to last, sadly, as Nikolai lost both of his parents early in his life and slowly grew more introverted and dark in his personality. So much so that when he eventually grew up and went to art school, he was given the name by his classmates of the Mysterious Dwarf. Gogol traveled widely, learning from various European arts and artists from Germany to Switzerland and even eventually to Rome. It was there the burgeoning author first encountered Italian literature and was so inspired by Dante's Inferno that he decided to write his own magnum opus, Dead Souls. He wrote and released the first part of it to massive acclaim, but this intense flame of success also burnt too quickly. After a religious pilgrimage to Jerusalem, he garnered a deep fear of damnation and sought help from Russian stadets, which are Russian Orthodox elders. And on top of that, from practicing strict ascetical practices, it subsequently left him empty and depressed. On the 24th of February, 1852, in a depressed and anxious rage, Gogol burned his manuscript for the second part of Dead Souls, which would never be recovered. He later explained it was a practical joke played on him by the devil. Immediately after, he took to bed, refused food, and died nine days later. This sad, dark tale has sparked a whirlwind of interest in Russia's very own Edgar Allan Poe. And his dark literary style is often a major influence in the seedy underbelly of the arts in this part of the world. But I don't like to overly focus on the dark. I prefer to shine the light on the man. So first thing in the morning, I went to his house, which to my luck is in Moscow. The tickets cost nothing and you can see the building in almost the original condition of how it was when he lived and later died there. You can see the fireplace where he burned his manuscripts with the paper still inside. You can encounter his prayer rope the Stoddards gave him to pray a single simple prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You'll often see prayer ropes like this all the time in Russian art and in churches. It's an ancient Orthodox practice similar to the Catholic Rosary. And the little frills at the bottom are actually there to wipe the tears from your eyes while you're praying. Which makes me feel intense feelings that I get to see something that held the tears of such a brilliant but tortured soul. 
Surprisingly, after Gogol was buried and the Soviets took over, they needed to move his remains to another monastery along with many other notable Russian imperial figures. And his former tombstone was then given as a grave marker to the person of our next inquiry, who is, many consider, the most unique thought during the Soviet era, Mikhail Bulgakov. Mikhail Afanasyevich Bulgakov was born on the 15th of May, 1891 in Kiev, also what is now Ukraine. He was the seventh child of an extremely devout Orthodox family, but he himself was always drawn to the theater. In fact, when he was a boy, he always wrote out comedies for his brothers and sisters to act out. In 1901, he joined a school where he grew a fancy for Russian literature and opera, discovering the likes of Gogol and Pushkin and Dostoevsky. But he wasn't quite destined for the literary life yet, and he joined instead the medical university where he graduated with top marks. During World War I, he went to the front lines as a doctor and was badly injured multiple times. This was Bulgakov's first exposure to what would be the first great struggle of his life, morphine addiction. You actually see him processing this struggle and dealing with the issues of war in one of his greatest works, in my opinion, A Young Doctor's Notebook. And if you're interested, you don't just have to read the book because the likes of Daniel Radcliffe and John Hamm were such big fans of Bulgakov that they helped get an adaptation of his work made in 2008 that you can watch online if you're interested. I think it's a great short introduction to his ironic and painful work. After leaving his countryside hospital, Bulgakov returned to Kiev to start his own private practice, where he encountered 10 government coups during the Russian Civil War. This was the last time in his life where he was able to see his family, because they all immigrated to parents while he was stuck in Russia with typhus and eventually couldn't leave behind the Iron Curtain. All these tragedies, though, are just the beginning of where I think his life story starts to get good. By being stuck in a country he didn't want to be in, in a time when he was a former white soldier and quite radical, meant his works would be inspired kind of inherently by dissent. Dissentful works, by the way, that were so good, even Stalin protected them. Stalin is recorded as saying that a writer of Bulgakov's quality was above, and I quote, party words like left and right. That alone should pique your interest. He wrote so many influential stories that even while I was making this, I discovered one of my favorite Soviet films, Ivan Vasilievich. It's about a time-traveling Soviet commissar who ends up in the times of Ivan the Terrible. It was actually written by him, it's in the title card. Although, with many places in the former USSR refusing to put on his plays or release his writings, he personally wrote to Stalin to ask if he would be allowed to emigrate abroad if the country didn't have a use for his writing. Stalin didn't want to lose such a talent, so he got him a job at the Bolshoi Theater, the largest theater in Moscow. But he left shortly after, realizing his satirical takes on Soviet society would frankly never be allowed on stage. At this point in his life, the only thing protecting Bulgakov from arrest and execution, shockingly, was Joseph Stalin. And if you need any reason to read this amazing writer's works, it's that he probably is one of the only writers in Soviet history that can say the man who did the Great Red Repressions protected him against the rest of the Soviet system. But sadly, even Stalin couldn't get his work published, and he had a second complete ban on his works right before his health began to turn bad. It was at this point the great countercultural icon focused on what he called his sunset novel, which became, in my eyes, his greatest work. A book which is truly one of those books that is far above left and right. It's called The Master and the Margarita. It's a book about Satan visiting Moscow in 1930 and how he handles the atheists there with pranks, brutality, and fantastical madness. The story mirrors another story about Jesus of Nazareth, although not as a religious savior in this case, but as a social philosopher. Bulgakov had succeeded in royally pissing off both left and right factions at the same time in one work. That's an achievement even for modern writers. When he finished the book, he had a private party to read it, and after it was finished, there was only silence in the room. Not for how good the book was, although I'm sure for many of them it was mind-blowing, but from how afraid they were. It wasn't until after his death on March 10th, 1940 that his book was even released to the public, and only after it was massively censored. He was buried in the same cemetery as his idol Gogol with his former headstone, where it lies to this day. And that, my dear viewers, is why I think Bulgakov is so unique and so special. He was protected by the man who didn't protect anyone. He took no sides and punched at everything he saw regardless of where or what they believed. 
He inspires actors even in the West today, and his influence stretches way farther than I can even go in one video. Which is why I just had to see his museum. It's in his former communal Soviet apartment in the middle of Moscow. But when I arrived, I realized, funnily enough, there are two museums. One is the official state-run museum, which isn't even in his actual apartment, it's just in his apartment building, and it's very clean-cut looking, although it's still kind of cool to see. The other one, which has all these cool statues in front of it, is built into his house, and is a shock compared to everything else that I've seen here. Fans of his have graffitied the walls of this still-used apartment complex with characters and slogans from his works. Everywhere you look here, there is something weird compared to societal standards both then and now. and it shows how tremendously wide his appeal is. There's actually a funny story about this place too that I heard. If you read the Master and the Margarita book, there's a scene where a man's head flies off of his body and passes a tram in the street. Well, in this place, they found a random Lenin statue head in the basement, and now they keep it next to the tram in the museum as a sort of nod to the book. And I'd like to think that Bulgakov would approve of such things. And the museum experience doesn't even end here because the museum gives both indoor tours here where you can see all of his possessions and works, but it also offers a walking and bus tour around the area where he based many of his sites from his book on. If you remember this little park from earlier, this is Patriarch Ponds. It's from the opening scene of Master and Margarita, which I just think is the coolest thing ever. He incorporated real places and people into his books, which is probably why it feels so real for so many. Both Gogol and Bulgakov represent a much larger and more wonderful tapestry that is the contributions Russians have made to the humanities. And these influences don't end in Eurasia, they go all the way through to some of the people who most likely inspire you today. I couldn't talk about Moscow's greatest historical sites without occasionally talking about those who influenced its builders, and Gogol and Bulgakov have easily been read and enjoyed by just about everyone who has contributed to the building up of this wonderful city that I get to stroll around today.